Okay, give me one sec. I just want to get this recording. Uh, yeah, recording is on. Okay, so I just want to thank Elizabeth Ropers and Chef <laughs> Paula and um, our and UJA for sponsoring this wonderful program and thank all you guys for being here tonight. We're very excited to learn about why the chosen people love chow mein. And um, I'm going to hand the floor over to Liz if you'd like to pin her so you could see her. Uh, pin me. Fine. Her. You thank can you. see her um, uh, larger on the screen. And I'm going to hand the floor right over to her. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm glad to see you all. My topic is why the chosen people choose chow mein. Okay. Um, if you remember the comedian Buddy Hackett, he used to have a joke that he told where he would say, according to the Jewish calendar, the year is 5781. According to the Chinese calendar, the year was 4717, which meant for about a thousand years, the Jews had to go without China. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, fine. So, one, uh, you know, a lot of what I'm telling you is based on a sociological study done by Gail Tuckman and I forget the other fellow's name. And as I was mentioning to Chef Paula, had we been in person, I would start by giving you fortune cookies, but nevertheless, <laughs> another time. Really? Anyway, why, why the attachment of New York Jews, especially to Chinese food? Understanding that people assign great meaning and importance to cuisine and food ways. Well, in this particular case, three themes predominate. First, Chinese food is unkosher and therefore non-Jewish, but because of the specific ways that Chinese food is prepared and served, immigrant Jews and their children found Chinese food to be more attractive and less threatening than other non-Jewish or trafe food. Chinese food became known as what we might call safe trafe, okay? <laughs> Chinese restaurant food used some ingredients that were familiar to Eastern European Jews. It does not mix milk and meat, and it doesn't use dairy products at all. And in addition, anti-Semitism, anti-Chinese racism, and the low position of the Chinese in American society, this is starting back in the early 1900s, also made Jews feel safe and comfortable in Chinese restaurants. Secondly, Jews construed Chinese restaurant food as cosmopolitan. For Jews eating in New York, Eating in Chinese restaurants signified that one was not a provincial or a parochial Eastern European Jew, not a greenhorn. In New York, immigrant Jews, and especially their children and grandchildren, regarded Chinese food as sophisticated and urbane. Third, by the second and third generation, Jews identified this kind of eating as non-Jewish food as something that modern American Jews and especially New York Jews did together. Eating Chinese became a New York Jewish custom, a part of daily life and self-identity for millions of New York Jews. Well, Jews encountered Chinese food in the streets of Lower Manhattan, Cantonese, Chinese, Eastern European Jews, and Southern Italians all came to New York at about the same time. Well, in Lower Manhattan, immigrant Jews opened delicatessens for other Jews, Italians ran restaurants for other Italians, and Germans had many places serving primarily Germans. But Chinese restaurants welcomed everyone. And as a result, even in the 1890s, both Jews and Italians usually felt more at home in Chinese restaurants than they did in each other's eateries. 
any immigrant family could eat at Chinese restaurants, and that as a group, Eastern European Jews ate at Chinese restaurants more often than any other immigrants. Now, Jews and Italians took to restaurants differently because they came from different cultures and they had different experiences before immigrating. And they came to America for different reasons. Many Italians who came here intended to work here for only a while. And by 1920, more had returned to Italy than had remained in the United States. Jews, however, had lived in various countries, been thrown out of various countries, and as increasingly unwelcomed and segregated strangers, they had fled discrimination and pogroms as well as poverty. So most of them who came here believed that they had no choice but to make their home here. Jews also appeared to have been less attached to their food specialties than Italians were to theirs, all right? Uh, as part of this study, informants tended to denigrate their ethnic restaurant food more than Italian Americans did there. They did not want to eat delicatessen very often because as one person who was interviewed said, we could eat that at home. What's the big deal? So Jews looking for nearby inexpensive restaurants could have patronized Italian places but they faced obstacles. First, like Jewish delis, Italian restaurants did not, as a rule, seek out the patronage of people from other ethnic groups. Secondly, because of competition for jobs, the anti-Semitic teachings of 19th century Catholicism, Jewish distrust of European Gentiles, and parental fears of intermarriage Jews and Italians at that time tended to be wary of each other. And third, Southern Italian neighborhoods and restaurants frequently displayed Christian images. The crucifixes and pictures of Jesus, Mary, and the saints made many Jews feel uneasy. However, foreign Chinese restaurants their decorations were non-Christian and they didn't raise the issue of Jews' marginal position in a Christian society. Wherever religious Jews had lived, kosher food was an elaboration of three dietary regulations derived from Exodus, Exodus Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Do not eat unclean animals and fish, do not inhumanely slaughter animals, and do not mix milk and meat. Well, at first glance, Chinese food seems an unlikely choice for Eastern European Jews. Chinese cooking does incorporate pork, shrimp, lobster, and other forbidden items. However, because of the several distinctive characteristics of Chinese cuisine, it was actually well suited for use by New York Jews seeking to demonstrate independence from the orthodoxies of traditional Eastern European Judaism. As I said, Chinese food was safe trade. As people who were interviewed for this study pointed out, Chinese cooking disguises tabooed ingredients by cutting, chopping, and mincing them. Ancient Chinese texts referred to cooking itself as kopeng, to cut and cook. And Chinese food could be adopted by rebellious Jews because the forbidden substances were so disguised that dishes did not reflexively repulse, and so undermine the ability to rebel. Many of the Jews interviewed for this study appreciated this disguise. Several reported what was certainly a very common experience. 
They love to eat egg rolls in Chinese restaurants because the pork and the seafood tasted delicious, but they were so minced that they could pretend they weren't there. <laughs> and one man who was interviewed said when he first put it and he thought he had pork in his mouth, he got a headache. But once he swallowed it miraculously, the headache disappeared. A woman in her 40s recorded dining regularly as a child with her sister. They ate spare ribs, sweet and sour pork. The mother did not eat pork, and the grandmother pretended not to know that there was trace on the table. And further, even non-religious or anti-religious first and second generation Jews had never eaten milk products with meat. Meat cooked with cheese was unfamiliar to Jews. It was repulsive. Well, German, Italian, French, and other European cuisines do cook cheese and milk with meat. Chinese cuisine was therefore unusually well suited to Jewish tastes because unlike virtually any other cuisine available in America, traditional Chinese cooking does not use any milk products whatsoever. So it fit in with the Jewish palate. In short, the chopped up tray, the lack of milk, the use of familiar ingredients. What do they put on the table at a Chinese restaurant? A pot of tea without milk. The low position of the Chinese in American society and the fact that they were not Christians and perhaps even other factors such as the formality of the Chinese manners made Chinese restaurants and their food feel safe for Jews. As I repeat myself, they were safe trade. Also, Chinese restaurants used exotic decorations, unusual wallpaper or paintings, lanterns placed with, placed with foreign designs. The waiters spoke a strange sounding language and were of a different race. The entrees bore exotic names, chow mein, mu gu gai pan, egg fu young, wonton. And it was as if it, they were experiencing exotic food and it made them feel cosmopolitan. It made them feel elevated. Well, many Americans and New Yorkers found in Chinese food a symbol of cosmopolitanism. But no other 20th century ethnic group that, in New York valued that as highly did Jews nor made it such an important part of a group identity. Along with attendance at theaters, remember theaters? Okay, <laughs> concerts, museums, and universities, Jews regarded eating at Chinese restaurants as a sign that they possessed the sophistication and urbanity so central to both modern society and to modern Jewish culture. Eating Chinese was also more fun than many of these other activities because in Chinese restaurants, ordering was half the fun, okay? The communal character of Chinese restaurant food, every dish is shared, one from column A, two from column B. I don't think they do that anymore, but I know I grew up and that's how it was, okay? That made it fun to order. And if ordering was half the fun, the other half was eating. Jews ate off their own plates. They ate off the serving plates. They ate off their friends' plates. And they shared special tidbits. And although Jews may have eaten that way sometimes at home, in Chinese restaurants, they did it regularly. A good meal, many said, required companions. Well, by the 1950s, Cantonese Chinese restaurants had become a New York family tradition. They welcomed children and even babies. And the menu sometimes explained that wonton soup was just chicken soup with crepla, okay? <laughs> and the column A and B choices were called family dinners. 
the larger the group, the more dishes they could take, taste. And on Sunday night, the restaurants and middle-class Jewish neighborhoods often had a waiting line. Well, Chinese restaurants also, the restaurateurs, have never stopped expanding and innovating. Chinese restaurants offered takeout long before McDonald's, Pizza King, and Colonel Sanders fried chicken. And in the 50s and 60s, as Jews prospered in the post-war boom, many Chinese restaurants began to deliver. I'm sure right now that comes in handy, okay? And after a hard day's work on a hot night or a cold snowy evening, families could eat Chinese food without going any further than the front door. And they had few competitors in that enterprise at that time and none served meals as good. Well, as time went on, some Jews became less attached to Chinese food. Some younger and the younger generations, they didn't want, they didn't want to do things that were like too Jewish. And as you know, there's been a decline in the level of Chinese restaurants. However, keeping up with the trends, I know right around here, the Chinese have Chinese kosher restaurants. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have one in Lawrence. You know, I've given this talk and I never put this together. It's called Chosen. Chosen. I looked at it as chosen, but it's chosen, the chosen people, right. chosen. So the Chinese, clever, okay, they went along with it. And some of the people interviewed said it was not uncommon for their grandparents and everything to have three sets of dinner, one for uh, meat, one for milk, and paid plates for Chinese, okay? So they accommodated it. So True. I want to turn this over, all right? Um, I do want to say that, yes, Martin did preempt me with that, but the it truth of it is, always. no, that's all right, Martin. The truth of it is that okay. when anybody asks a Jewish person, what are you doing Christmas? Uh -huh. The answer ubiquitously is where else? Chinese, Chinese food. <laughs> so I will leave you with that thought and I will turn this over to Chef Paula. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. This is one thing that chosen restaurant they speak Yiddish. No. The, the people Chinese that, people speak the Yiddish? People, the oh, yeah. That work there speak and Yiddish. Israel, they speak Hebrew. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> no, they yes. speak Yiddish. Okay. And the fortune cookies in Israel are in Hebrew. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> I did eat Chinese food in Israel. You're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think we should hand the floor over to Chef Paula now, because those of you who are waiting to cook, I'm sure are very hungry. Um, <laughs> Chef Paula, the floor is yours. Excellent. And again, if you want to pin her, it would be a good idea so you could see her take up the whole screen, so you could see her chopping and first, all right, wait. Okay. Hey everybody, I want to welcome you and I'm so thrilled. In addition to all the new faces to out, out here tonight, I also have some of my Monday night Cooking with Stars uh, students, which is wonderful. So guys, I'm Chef Paula. My husband, Michael, is uh, my right hand in every, every par part, part of my partnership. And we are Cooking with Stars, as our banner says behind us. Uh, we have been doing virtual cooking classes now for nearly eight months. Uh, and as you see our setup, guys, you have a split screen, you have me, and you also have what I want you to see, whether it's my caddy of food or whether it's my chopping, uh, my chopping block, maybe it's my um, box grater. So whatever I'm gonna be doing, you guys can hear me, see me, uh, and best of all, see exactly the process of us working to make a delicious food. As I mentioned to some of you guys who came on early, you guys know that I had mentioned, I grew up in Brooklyn. I had a dad who grew up on the Lower East Side. Chinese food was everything to him. He actually, as I was growing up as a child, 
he would take cooking and catering classes. And the two kinds that I remember the most were his kosher catering classes and his Chinese classes. Those for him were just basically the, the, the crux mm -hmm. of, of his life. So for me, going to all these great Chinese restaurants, the one food I automatically turned down every single time was chow mein. And I don't know if it was the hot celery or I don't know what it was, but there was something about the texture I just didn't like. So when I got this challenge uh, from Lisa and from Marcy to be able to come up with a menu, I said, you know what, I am gonna challenge myself and have a recipe that while I wouldn't like it as a child, I will love it as an adult. So we're calling this guys ultimate chicken chow mein. So I wanna ask everybody here, whether you grew up in the city, whether you grew up out, out here or wherever, how many of you guys had definitely Chinese uh, chow mein as your staple food when you go, go to a Chinese restaurant? How yes. many people, raise your hand. Yes. 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 So now, guys, there are two kinds of, of chow mein, which I learned in doing research. There's the East Coast version. There's the West Coast version. Is there anybody else initially from the West Coast, guys? And I don't mean West Coast of New York. I definitely mean California. <laughs> because their, their chow mein would have soft noodles, which is kind of like, in my mind, it's more like lo mein. But their chow mein had soft noodles in the dish. Ours has one key ingredient, which I gotta tell you, so happy I was able to get them. These are my chow mein noodles. Uh, so I remember the one, my, my father had white rice as the base, all the good stuff up top, all the vegetables and the chicken, and then the topping would be these crispy, delicious noodles. Is that how you guys remembered your chow mein? Yes, yes, yes that's how it was. Yes. So that is the typical East Coast version. Uh, and I'm kind of curious if we kind of finesse this the way I'm hoping to, maybe at some future point, I'll introduce the West Coast version and we'll be able to compare and contrast and see which coast makes a better chow mein. You guys with me? Yes. yes. Okay, all right. So let's take a little look about what it takes to make this dish. Now, here's the best part of all. If you are a vegetarian, you can make this with tofu. If you are someone who is a, ch a chicken, uh, you know, poultry lover, please get yourself uh, two cups of chicken breast made into you know, small cubes. That would be the protein. If you're gonna be doing um, tofu, have some really nice firm tofu, which will mimic the actual uh, integrity of the chicken. But how do we make chicken chow mein taste like something, guys? So we're gonna have here uh, a couple of different things. Let's talk to about veggies. Chicken chow mein has great things to be able to give it some really, really nice mouthfeel. I have some celery. I have some scallions. I have some carrots. I have a bell pepper. I have some delicious green cabbage. And I also have some things which are very traditional. I have bean sprouts. Uh, in the can department, guys, I have baby corn. I have some water chestnuts. Mm -hmm. And then the things that would make the, the sauce, if you will, we're gonna have some chicken broth. We're gonna have some uh, sesame oil, a little bit of um, low sodium uh, soy sauce, a little bit of, thank you Mike, a little bit of oil. And to kind of make it a little bit more thick, guys, we're putting a, a little bit of cornstarch in to give it some integrity. Uh, a little bit of garlic powder and a little bit of black pepper. And this is not a typical stir fry because a typical stir fry, I'd use onions, not scallions. Uh, I would also make sure guys that I had fresh garlic, fresh ginger. So these flavors that we're using in terms of using a powdered uh, garlic, it's not going to be as intense or we're not having a ginger. So this is not, again, a typical stir fry. This really is a chow mein. So are you all ready to cook with me or yes. watch me cook? <laughs> so is there anybody, we have like 25 people tonight. I think Lisa is cooking. Uh, is Marcy cooking? I wanna just get a sense of who's cooking here tonight, guys. Maybe Lisa. I know Lisa's cooking. I think Marcy, yes, no? Yes, I'm cooking. Okay, cool. Stacy and David, you're, you're, you're my, my regulars. You guys are with me? There's someone there. And, uh, we're watching. Uh, oh. Hey, Stacy. Hey, David. 
Hi. 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 All right, so now we're blending all our worlds together. And I wanted to show you behind me, guys. I created a banner that actually, Michael, show this. Oh, yeah, Pamela, thanks. <laughs> So guys, if you notice behind me, oh, I'm with yeah. this guy. Out of the way. We have a couple of things. We've got my Jewish stars, and we've got my little fortune cookies and my takeout boxes. You guys see it? No. Oh, there it is. <laughs> That's cute, Paula. <laughs> so I figured. Listen, I'm I'm putting I'm blending both of my worlds together. So it's important to have you guys represented properly. All right, guys. So the chicken has already been processed. Michael was kind enough uh, off camera to be able to make them. Uh, no, a little bit. So the, the chicken is done, but now let's get to doing the vegetables. Chops are not cooked. Correct. So when I, say, when I say it's done, he just basically cut, cut the chicken. So on my board, guys, I'm gonna take my celery. Everything has been washed. And one thing I always believe in, I always like to have a garbage bowl nearby so any of the parts that I don't need go right into the garbage bowl. So guys, we're gonna take our celery, make sure everyone can see me. And I'm just gonna be chopping off the parts that I don't want. I'll tell you, if you keep the leaves, guys, the leaves actually do make a really beautiful um, flavor. I know, I know, I know. So I got, the goal here is to make everything on the bias. So I'm going to basically take my knife and for those who are cooking, try and cut them on the bias, on its angle. What's now, the I, reason? What's the reason for yeah, it? I, I think the real reason is the way it's going to cook. I think the appearance also, and I think that that's, that's going to be just, just a second. So, so guys, I'm going to be doing this in an electric skillet. Uh, the skillet itself is going to be preheated, but right now, guys, just prep the veggies. So right now, I want to be able to get my celery, three stalks, people. Again, if you're someone who loves celery, you're welcome to do more than the three stalks. Okay. The recipe calls for three stalks, and you're up to, up to whatever you feel comfortable doing. Okay, I got you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Michael do the last celery while I go on to the next one. But I want to just know if anybody has questions, please guys, ask away. My goal is to be able to make this as fun for you. And even if you're not cooking tonight, I'm hoping the recipe looks good enough for you. You'll want to do it when you have your own free time to do so. I used to get your own, your own board. All right, so guys, so the three things are gonna be sauteed first, are gonna be the three celeries, Three, three of the carrots um, and the bell pepper. So that's going to pretty much be what we're looking to do. So right now I've got two celeries done. How does that look, guys? Looks good. Now my carrots are organic carrots. Now because I'm using organic carrots, I don't feel the need right now, guys, to be able to, I, I already scrubbed them but I don't need to be able to take off uh, any of the excess skin. If the carrots were not organic, I would be more inclined to do so. So again, situation is, I'm looking to do it again on the bias, guys. The baby carrots, so about how many, you think? Three. So right now, I would say- have the little ones. Okay, so, but, but, so then maybe do four or five. You know, the goal is to be able to make it what you think you, you love. If, I, if carrots are what you love, then definitely do more than, more than I'm even saying. The recipe calls the three large. And interestingly enough, the organic carrots were not large. The carrots going in. So of the people on the call tonight, the Zoom guys, how many of you are actively cooking still? Can you guys give me an idea who I'm working with? I'm cooking. Yeah. I'm cooking. I'm cooking. I'm cooking. cooking and on. Does anyone ever cook Chinese food at home? No. 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 Never tastes the same. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know what? I'm a lot. I totally get that. But here's what I'm going to tell you. I've been a chef for 15 years. And I became a chef literally after my dad had passed. And he was my best friend and I was beyond devastated. It was the funeral, at my dad's funeral, a rabbi who didn't even know me 
gave me a piece of advice that changed my total life. And he said, the best way to honor my dad's memory is to keep alive traditions that were important to him. What were those? And I said, well, my dad was a foodie. Ooh. He did everything, cooking, oh my God. In fact, you know, he would make all kinds of wonderful, you know, parties and luau's and just, he was just so, he was such a purist. He just wanted everything to be so beautiful and great. And so I said, you know what? If I become a chef and I can inspire children and adults to have a passion for food, that is the best way I can honor my dad's memory. And so guys, for 15 years, I've been doing that. And I will tell you, while COVID hit and all the schools and the JCCs and the libraries and all the places I, I've been working for 15 years would no longer have me come in person, the fact that I get to meet so many people from all over the country now has been a game changer. So I so, so, so love, you know, being able to share uh, family recipes and recipes that I've, you know, taken a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B and, uh, you know, make it happen. So guys, carrots again, going on the bias. Terrible. You know? Um, and so guys, what I would say to you is you could make this dish really your own. For people who don't like corn, people who don't like water chestnuts, don't use it. If you guys want a little extra crunch instead, maybe you want to use sugar snaps. There's so many ways to really make this something that your family is going to love. All of that. And guys, please, I want, I, want, I want to hear from you. I want to be able to have you ask me questions. Just last week, I worked with the um, Bristol Assisted Living in Westbury, and it was National Italian American Heritage Day. So, you know, part of what I loved was being able to have you guys just talk to me. I can cook, and I can talk, and listen, and chop at the same time. Anyone have any questions? Where do you live now? I just wanted to ask. Yes, yes. Uh, I remember Chinese uh, chow mein had a lot of uh, onions in it. Yes, now th that is true. That is the recipe that my father would also have me have. And I have to tell you, maybe it was that coupled with the celery that I just didn't like. But you are correct. The original one he had was like a two note. It was two notes, guys. Onions and celery. That was it. Yeah. Ours is going to have an onion note, guys, but it's going to be coming from scallion. And the scallions will give you the onion, oniony flavor. But yes, if you do want onions in here, go for it. You certainly can do it. I added some. Yeah, exactly. This is something that, you know, definitely relies a lot more heavily on the other flavors. Onion takes over. And I love them. But in this situation, it takes over. Um, bell pepper. So guys, the bell pepper, any color will do. Uh, we, we took out all the seeds, guys, and the ribs. All right, so. So depending upon when you guys, guys, when you do any kind of walk work, like right now, I'm going to be working with an electric skillet. But if you want to work with a wok, it's very, very essential that the kinds of vegetables you cook, uh, if you want them all done at the same time, they're going to be basically cut in very, very similar shapes. So right now, I'm not making them you know, very, very skinny. This is going to be a hearty chow mein, and that's the way I want it. Okay. Shh. It's just the two of you. The white stuff. If you have the um, vegetables raw, do mm -hmm. you still cut them on the bias? Yes, yes. In fact, when I do okay. stir fries almost all the time, like I'll do, I'll, uh, in fact, uh, Stacy, David, Marcy, Shari, and Elaine are with me on Monday nights. And when we do any kind of stir fry, we definitely do them on the bias. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yep, exactly. And I will tell you that it just cooks really nicely that way. I think the surface area of the vegetables hug the pot really nicely. Things don't like wobble all over the place and just really works out nicely. All right, guys, so we're gonna be putting in my skillet, or if you have your stovetop skillet, one tablespoon of olive oil. No, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, correct. So, so, so guys, the people who, the, it's, it's the chicken first. So guys, let me just make sure. 
This is now gonna be layer one after the chicken cooks. So I wanna make sure that everyone is cooking with us has their two cups of chicken breast cut into small cubes or two cups of firm tofu cut into, into cubes. Once the chicken is done cooking, we're gonna be putting all of this good stuff right into the pan. So all those people cooking, you guys already have your chicken prep guys, which means just small cubes of chicken and or tofu. Uh, Paula, yes. uh, if you don't want celery in it, would you suggest you use onions? You can, you can. I mean, celery, like I said, celery will give it yeah, a- Yeah, but I, celery- no, I'm say, if, you don't, if you don't like celery, take it out. You can, you can use onion, but here's the difference. Celery is gonna give you a salt, a salt base. So it's gonna give you a salty kind of flavor. It's not gonna be an onion flavor, but onions are delicious. So please, I'm not, I'm, I no, love onions. Is there something else you can substitute, substitute um, the celery? Here or are we cooking? What else, here or there? what else, the question is, what else do you have to offer? I don't know what you have in your pantry. What else do you have as a- as I don't know. <laughs> right now it's bare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I would say, is celery an option for you for going forward? Because I will tell you, it's a very traditional chow mein flavor. It just it has the crunch, it has the crispness of it, it gives the saltiness of it. Maybe it's, the snow peas would be like you kind can, of you, you, can definitely, you can definitely do snow peas. Listen, you guys, you can put broccoli in there. I love oh. celery. Okay. You know, so the thing is, celery is very traditional chow mein, guys. That's the, I don't, I don't always put it into all my Chinese food, but this one in particular, it's kind of important. So guys, right now, I'm going to tell you that we have our cubes of chicken. Paula, why yes, are you I'll using, why did you choose olive oil? You know, I got to tell you guys, I use olive oil almost exclusively. And I, Trader Joe has a really good president reserve. And for me, I use it almost all the time. On occasion, I'll use canola, but it really is my, my go-to oil. And it's not a situation where I need to worry about the smoke point and burning it. If you really know how to handle it, guys, it works well for me. And I feel, I feel it's a healthier oil. You know, if you guys are in a situation, you go into a Chinese restaurant, they may cook in peanut oil. You know, I'm not doing that, guys. You know, I'm gonna be cooking it in a neutral enough oil but one that for me, I feel is a lot healthier than using a canola. Do you use virgin, virgin olive yes, oil? Yes, extra virgin olive oil. Ideally, if you can get the first press one, yes, 100%. This one, I gotta tell you, as, as a, maybe a $9 oil from Trader Joe, it's wonderful. It has a light fruitiness to it. It's incredible, guys. If you've ever had, had it or haven't had it, Get it back in your kitchen. It's a really nice oil. Right. So guys, the chicken itself, it's again, this is again, all things are equal. This is a simplified um, chow mein. The goal is not to have ginger and all the crazy aromatics. We're not putting garlic, ginger, or the things I would put in a typical stir fry. We just want to have the chicken be able to be nice and, and cooked. Uh, and we're going to then marry it with a sauce and more veggies. So guys, I'm going to cut the scallions. And the scallions are going to be added in last. The scallions and also the bean sprouts. So I'm going to show you, get some pictures of this. So guys, I'm just taking all my little hairy ends, my little root ends away, because clearly I don't need them. And I'm going to be cutting them also, thank you, also on the bias. And what's great is, guys, yep, I can do three or four together. So, guys, for those who are cooking, I'm using four uh, of my four of my green scallions, white and green, both guys. We use them both. Make sure it doesn't stop. So, guys, everyone is cooking. Make sure that your chicken is getting into that little pan of yours. Scallions done, carrots done, bell peppers done, celery done. Uh, next up, guys, we're going to be having some of our uh, green cabbage. Does anyone use green cabbage on a pretty routine basis? Um, sure. You got a picture of the whole board? Coleslaw. Yeah? Coleslaw. Yes, yes. Mm. But it's really funny, guys. In Brooklyn, 
my mother knew the value of cabbage and she would grate cabbage into our salads at night, whether it was the, the purple cabbage or uh, the green cabbage. Really interesting. She really, really knew the cabbage was great. Uh, where's my cabbage? I was such a bad shopper this week. I forgot the celery and I forgot the cabbage. Hey guys, I'm using, I'm using a tool now. <laughs> Didn't have cabbage either. A food mover, guys, but it really, in this case, is really truly a bench scraper. And it lets me be able to just move it in large batches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the green onion. No. Just the carrots, the celery, and the pepper, mm -hmm. peppers together. I'm going to take my scallions, I'll be putting them in another bowl later. Yeah. Oh, the scallion smells so nice. Again, these were organic scallions, organic. Uh, mm -hmm. Beautiful. Can you guys smell how delicious this is? <laughs> it does smell good, Paula. Thanks. <laughs> all the way, all the way to Houston. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so, guys, what what we have here are bean sprouts. Bean sprouts are going to give the uh, chicken chow mein a wonderful crunch. Again, crunch with the celery, crunch with the bean sprouts, crunch with the noodles. That's, that was what we remember, guys, crunchy. Um, so I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to, if you are using your, um, yeah, your green cabbage, uh, the tool that would definitely be getting the job done well, guys, is a box grater. And I guarantee every Jewish mother has a box grater. Mm -hmm. Am Goodbye. I right, guys? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Watch your fingers. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I want to put pressure Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, the amount of... Um, Cabbage we're looking for is about two cups of shredded. Okay, just two cups shredded. Cabbage. Okay. All right, so guys, any questions in between us going on to stage two? Anybody? No, can you use a food processor for the cabbage? Yeah. Make life easy, yes, 100%. Uh, and the thing is, sometimes, guys, using a food processor, but when I'm making latkes, if I use a food processor, sometimes it will make complete mush out of some of the things I need. What I want here is I want to have a little bit of structural integrity. Yeah. I want to have my cabbage and all my vegetables right now. I like doing it by hand, but if it makes life easier for you, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Beautiful. Chef Michael, awesome. All right, guys, two cups worth. Now, the chicken, I want to make sure that everybody who has had the chicken cooking is monitoring it, making sure, moving, around, moving it around making sure that you guys are cooking well. So Marcy, your chicken is in good shape. Lisa, your chicken's in good shape. Doing tofu. Okay, beautiful. So you use a uh, liquid measuring cup? No, for no, no, no. He just, he, Michael gave me oh, this. Oh, okay, because yeah, because otherwise I would use that. Definitely not. That, okay. was, that was put here for all my liquids, but. Oh, okay, so this is handy for today, is that what it is? <laughs> exactly, not, not, the, not the tool of choice. We so are I know, this. yes. <laughs> exactly right. This is the two cup line. Guys, once the chicken is completely cooked, that is when we're gonna start to put in the actual beautiful tri-color, orange, red, and green from our celery, our carrots, and our bell peppers. That's gonna be the first thing that we're gonna be layering into the chicken. Uh, but I want to start getting a little bit more going, guys, because I have a couple of canned items that I want to be able to process as well. And yeah, I, so guys, you oh, I don't, listen, I, I know I don't have to tell you guys that washing cans, even before COVID, always did it. I never knew where my food was coming from, and it could be sitting on a warehouse floor getting lots of dust in it. Before I came here, everything was washed. Pre-COVID, post-COVID, during COVID, all the time. So guys, I love corn, and as the recipe is written, we're going to be having some baby corn. Oops. Yay! Yeah. Baby corn. No, no, no. Not all done separately. 
So guys, baby corn. And then I also have some water chestnut. The baby corn goes in as it is. I could make them smaller if I chose to, but I love baby corn and I just want to have that whole entire mouthfeel. And now I'm going to be draining some water chestnuts. Do you guys eat water chestnuts when you have gone to Chinese restaurants? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I use it at home when I make Chinese food. Oh, there you go. Even better. Okay. I use them all the time. Yay. Perfect. So the cans of baby corn. Mm -hmm. Hold up a second. Yep, yep, get yep. Shot, okay. So guys, all the photos from all this cooking, we're going to be putting on our Cooking with Sars Facebook page. So if you guys want to see photos from tonight, I'll make a big post. Uh, I will tag the Freeburg JCC in it. I'm sure Lisa and Marcy will also share it with you guys. So everyone will see all these steps. Uh, you guys already have access to the recipe again as well. I have the recipe in front of me and I'm taking notes and I will be Excellent. Baking. That's what I want. In fact, I got to tell you, I have a couple people on the call tonight that when they're with me, they don't often cook. They ask questions, they write notes down, and then they will make it in their own time and then send me back the photos of what they've created. So, yeah. So, I'm, so guys, the uh, water chestnuts, I am going to slice. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How do you oh. slice yours? Is there any I, usually, I usually cut them in half. I can do half. I mean, this, I think a lot of it's going to depend heavily on how big they are, but you're right. These are definitely not big. Halves can work brilliantly. The recipe was sent, I see it in the chat. The recipe was sent if you registered through the Freeburg JCC link. Yep, um, yep, yep. Uh, and you should have gotten it on there when you got your confirmation. Um, if not, we can send it out. Um, just email. And the link is available at our website, cookingwithstars.com slash Freeburg JCC. Right. That, we built a page just for you guys specifically. But we already have our already. Yeah, we have our already slides. All right, guys. So the water chestnuts, we were looking for about a seven ounce can. Uh, the baby uh, corn, about a 15 ounce can, which I think is pretty standard size wise. Mm -hmm. How's the chicken doing, Mike? Can you use frozen corn? Absolutely. Can I tell you, and this is no joke, people. I, I like to be able to get all of my perishables and all my produce very close to my classes. So we bought everything today. And the two things I could not get <laughs> were these gorgeous corns. I don't know, Marge is not a big corn lover. I love corn. And to be able to finally have a recipe that utilizes baby corn, I was like over the moon, but I couldn't get it. And I'm like, oh my God, Mike. So I sent him out to a second store to get the corn. And I also wasn't able to get bean sprouts. So my produce guy, and it's a big, big store, but they said that they just didn't have it in. So now we have our bean sprouts. Now we have our water chestnuts. Now we have everything we need to make this dynamite. So guys, while Chef Michael is going to add in the bell peppers, the, the actual uh, carrots and the celery, my goal on, for me guys is to be able to make the sauce because as lovely as it is, well honey, Vegetables go in now if the chicken is after the chicken is fully cooked, Marcy. Yeah, I am. I'm yeah. Chicken. Guys, yes. So the only so guys, the only three vegetables going into layer one is gonna be the carrots, the bell peppers, and the celery. Get it all in. Yeah. I'm gonna be working on guys the uh, delicious uh, sauce. Now give me the um you you take the all right, hold on, guys. And then, what do I also need? I also need my measuring, my measuring cup. Measuring cup, measuring cup. All right, so guys, we have to do a, a quick little, you know what, let's put it in here. I'm gonna do a quick little rinsey rinse, guys, because Michael didn't know what I needed that for. Thank you, I got it, I got it. So watch, watch his pan, I'll be right back, guys. Yep. Watch it cook. Yeah. <laughs> Once a chip, yeah. Once the chicken's fully cooked, yeah, fry it for three minutes or until slightly softened. Perfect. Yeah. All right, guys. For those of you who just, I want to make sure everyone who's cooking, your bell peppers, your carrots, and your celery are now starting to marry in that delicious uh, chicken pan. 
Uh, if you have done that, guys, I can go on to the actual dressing or the, the actual sauce to bring it together. So you just keep it separate in the pan. You're not putting so you you know, Honestly, that's how he chose to do it. Because oh, okay. usually in a wok, the surface, you, have, you Correct. can't do it like that. Correct. Okay. That's the thing. We, when we were teaching in all of our after-school classes, now guys, remember, until COVID, where we actually have kitchens to be able to work out of, I had to bring and creative ways to be able to make hot food. So I was bringing skillets and griddles, you know, to my classes. So I will tell you the value of an electric skillet is a big yeah. one. Has anyone ever used an electric skillet? I use it all the time. Me too. So you, you guys know. At dial least my latkes in an exactly, electric exactly. skillet. Exactly. <laughs> so dial it to whatever number you need it and it right. will hit that number. Right. You put on the stove top, it's hit or miss. This is exact, so. All right, guys. So if everyone is ready to now work with me to be able to make your delicious uh, marinade, if you will, or, or sauce. So guys, we, we wanna start out by, if you are vegetarian, make it veggie stock. If you guys are not vegetarian, chicken stock. Guys, we're looking for two cups of some kind of stock uh, that will really make it beautiful and flavorful. Yep, yep. Okay. Now, truth be told, guys, left hand to God, I normally use Manischewitz uh, chicken broth, and I couldn't get it today. I mean, it was just one of those days. Really? I didn't see that. Really? Oh, picture? Yeah. I, I look, I, when I can, I like kosher chicken. I like kosher chicken, chicken stock. So I got one out of the two. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. You know okay, so we're looking for two cups of broth of some kind of broth, guys. Okay. Now, I, one thing about this OXO measuring cup. Oh, yeah, so I use that all the time. It's the best, right? You do too. Yeah, so I have to uh, typically <laughs> get that number, hits it beautifully. And I'm almost there, guys. What is the make of your uh, skillet? Uh, the skillet is Presto. That's it. Presto. Because I have a very old one and I went to replace it mm -hmm. and it was terrible. And mine was, I, so I says, I'm not throwing mine out and I returned the other. And you, so. know what, you know what's good guys? The actual probe, the electric probe that dials in the, the actual amount of heat you fits can watch. the Presto griddle. So it's wonderful. I can take one, one of those and be able to get two units be able to be working together. All right, guys, two cups of chicken broth. Um, now, Marcy, are you guys using sesame oil? Did you guys do the sesame oil? Lisa, are you guys using sesame oil? Can I put yes. the oil in here? No. Oh, no. Yep. Hey, Paula. Yes. I use sesame oil. Yep. It's pink. Yeah. And that's the thing. Sesame oil is a very in-your-face flavor. Mm -hmm. Right, correct. In-your-face flavor. So you need to be able to kind of dial it down a little bit, guys. Let's show them what's going on in the pan. Much on the sesame oil? Was it the um? So, 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 get, so to do the sauce, guys, it's two cups of chicken broth, three tablespoons of cornstarch, a tablespoon of sesame oil, a quarter cup of low sodium soy sauce. Soy. <laughs> so low sodium soy, half a teaspoon of garlic powder, and a half a teaspoon of uh, black pepper. So tell me who's ready to now go on to building. You guys ready for me? So two cups of broth, guys. Some for that fashion of broth. Um, there was Paula. Yes. I'm going to switch. I'm going to get off the computer. Yeah, you, you'll go on to your phone. You got it, sweetheart. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. All right, guys. Chicken broth is in. Um, Paula, does the broth go into the pot or it goes? Yes, it does. So okay. once we combine everything and make it the exact consistency, then it goes into the pot. What I don't so want to have happen, guys, I don't want you to say, oh, my God, it's not thick enough. Let's get it right here before it goes into the pan. All right, guys. So again, that is done. Uh, let's get some sesame oil. One tablespoon, everybody. If you have it. If you don't have it, that's okay. It will give you guys a really beautiful, I almost want to say um, an earthy quality. Like a nutty quality, which is weird because I can't eat nuts, but I can eat sesame. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yep. So guys, one tablespoon will do you. Yeah, it's, it definitely has a real, really heavy duty, earthy, beautiful umami kind of flavor. 
So that's done. Uh, the soy sauce, guys, will be about one quarter cup. Uh, I choose to use low sodium because why would I do anything other than that? One quarter cup. All right, guys, one quarter cup low sodium. Um, there are different versions of low sodium, but they're all high enough that if you really are on a salt restrictive diet, you know, just, just, just be cautious is my point. You have a picture? It's low with sodium, but it's not a low sodium. Exactly. It's lower, it's lower than, than it would be if you didn't have it. Uh, we did go with the low sodium yep. chicken broth. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, the regular chicken broth was between 500 and 400. And this low sodium chicken broth has 40 per cup, 40 milligrams of sodium per cup. So we're definitely, uh, we saved 400 milligrams of sodium by going with a low sodium stock. So guys, I'm going to add the cornstarch last because I want to make sure it dissolves perfectly. So please get yourself some garlic powder. And I got to tell you, while I don't work for Costco, this Kirkland garlic powder is so good. Is there anyone who uses this routinely? My daughter loves that. It has such, such, such a great flavor and it lasts a long time. It's beautiful, guys. Okay. So we're looking for a uh, half a teaspoon. Now don't forget, guys, when you're using powdered powder versus garlic and actual the bulb, you will find that, and this one is a really super, I mean, it smells like I, I, I bought it yesterday. Um, it will definitely, you don't need a lot of it. So a half a teaspoon is all you're gonna need to really give it that beautiful flavor. Get a quick picture. And you're gonna whisk it, guys, once we get the cornstarch in here and the black pepper, we're gonna whisk it. Um, you could use salt if you choose to, but for me, guys, I just put so low sodium soy, which is still salty, so I'm not adding salt. You could if you want to but I came from a household so where, you know, we just didn't do that. Um, the black pepper is also a half a teaspoon. <laughs> and guys, the cornstarch in this case is three full tablespoons. This is gonna give our, our broth or our sauce a chance to get a little bit thicker. Mm -hmm. So everybody who's cooking, you guys with me? Yes. Okay, perfect. How many like, people are served with this recipe? What was that? Uh, six, this is, this is meant for six people. Thank you. You know, I like that Argo came out with this container instead of the box of corn Yes, you know? I agree. <laughs> hey. I agree. Okay, Got last one in, guys. Okay. All right, so my... my... What is this? You didn't get this out of here. All right, guys, so I'm going to take my whisk, and we're going to whisk away. Make sure, everybody, that there's no cornstarch hugging the walls of your bowl. You want to make sure everything is completely combined. So in the bowl, guys, you're looking for basically a brownish kind of sauce or marinade, I guess we can call it. Now, guys, at this point, I am just... Is it a slurry because the cornstarch is in there? Or? Correct, correct, correct. It won't get thick until you heat it. Right, so the heat, the heating is going to make it thicker, guys. So right. All I want to do right now is just to be able to make sure all that, that beautiful cornstarch, I'm going to give it an opportunity to blend with my liquid. Once it hits the pan, it should get nice and thick. You're not going to see it in the bowl now. To come to a now, what I will do, everybody, I want to take a little taste. I want to double check, because I didn't put salt in, that we're really where we need to be. So I'm going to take a quick little spoon's worth. All right, my Michael wants to give me a piece of, piece of cabbage. Okay, I can do cabbage. Let's see how we did. It's good. The answer is, 
I probably would like a little more salt, but if we're looking to be a little, little bit more salt sensitive, quarter cup of, a quarter, a quarter cup is, is, is fine. Sodium is 590 yeah. per tablespoon. I know, I know. And you, you, a quarter of a cup. I don't want cornstarch. Four tablespoons. So you've already got six times four is 2400 milligrams of sodium in a quarter cup. So you got to take this off. So guys, I want to have you. know what I'm saying? Yes, I do. 590 per tablespoon. We've got four tablespoons. Open up. So 600 times four is 2400. Uh, 2400 milligrams You're of right? sodium in a quarter cup. All right, so guys, get your chicken. Move your chicken around. I want to make sure everything is combined. Get, get me all the flavors. Mix them, mix them, mix them, mix them. Are we ready for? Yes. So what Michael did, guys, he put a little covering on our skillet uh, to be able to make things cook a little bit more quickly. So you guys can see what's going on. The carrots still do not cut, so they're still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I would say, guys, it probably will take a good, you know, three, four minutes more to get the carrots, the for, uh, celery, not yet. Sauce? Nope. I also did get a little brown color on my chicken over the last few minutes. Didn't stick, but they got a little beautiful color. Now, guys, I'm going to add in now the cabbage. Guys, cabbage and corn are the next to be added in. You guys see what this looks like? Oh, it looks nice. Close it up. smells heavenly, people. Cabbage go in, corn goes in. Okay. Yeah. All right. mm -hmm. Guys, another beautiful tool is tongs. You guys use tongs a lot? Yes. Tongue it. So guys, now, once all this comes together, we'll put our sauce in and it will become delicious. So you wanna be able to start adding these things in layers. We did the chicken first, we did the harder vegetables second, the softer vegetables third. Now we're gonna be putting the sauce, which kind of puts it all together. Now, Does the scallion go in or not yet? No, 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 scallions yeah. and the bean sprouts go yes. in the very end for just the, the last little bit. I'm also going to add in our chestnuts. Bring the chestnuts in before the, the sauce. last two things you want to add in again are going to be the scallions and the bean sprouts. Let that be the last things. So is, does everyone have their sauce ready to rock and roll? No. All right, if you're, if you're, not, you're not ready. My sauce does not look like your sauce. What does your sauce look like? Show me. Actually, let's, let's do that. We can pin you. Show me what Michael, go in and deep. Go in there. Let's see what your sauce looks like, Lisa. Uh, is that Lisa? Yep. Show me, show me. Now you, now, you probably use veggie stock, yes? I did. Okay, so is it the color or the thickness that you're, you're, you're seeing? Because veg, the vegetable stock is going to have a different color as a base. Okay. And also, this this particular stock had no salt in it. Is that okay? Should we add salt? So the thing is, I would say so. Mine also had none in it, but because, like Michael said, there's 500 milligrams of sodium per, per tablespoon. Per tablespoon. Four tablespoons. So right now, you you dictate what right. you feel comfortable doing. Okay. I want you to love it. Because this is a low sodium. Uh, exactly, uh, guys. The special sauce that I that I got. Before. Okay. Add the sauce. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to add the sauce. So, guys, sauce goes in, and let's get everything. Watch out for the cornstarch will settle. So you want to mix it right before you dump it in. That mm -hmm. cornstarch will settle to the bottom. OK. Mix, mix, mix. And that big box spoon. So guys, the smell of what I have is delicious. I smell the smokiness of the sesame. Can you guys see what's going on? My baby. 
Mm -hmm. Mix it all together. It smells good so far. Right? And you guys can serve this over rice. You yeah. can serve it over noodles. Uh, you can just use this as is and put the noodles on top. Uh, this really is a very complete meal. And this is meant to feed a family of six. So depending really? upon, you know, what you guys are in terms of, you know, big eaters or not, this could look, you can get leftovers for a couple of, couple of servings, guys. Yeah, it doesn't look like six. Can we do this over cauliflower rice? Why not? Why not? Mm. Absolutely. 100%. Would it still taste good? Yes. Gonna get now guys, you do you do want to bring it up to a boil. Yes. Um, that's an important aspect of it. So the cornstarch will not do its thing unless it really comes up to a proper temperature. Is Marcy, can I see what your pan looks like? I just got more computer. Okay. Michael's gonna pin you. Mm -hmm. I think that only affects you, Chef Paul. That doesn't. Well, I didn't use a lot of the vegetables because, like I said, I did bad shopping. I understand. But can you see it? <laughs> Let me see. I see you, honey. I see a lot, a lot of sauce. So you definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of sauce. sauce. Okay. All right, a little, little sauce heavy. Yeah, again, the most important thing to do is learn some technique tonight, and then when you do it on the next pass, You'll have more vegetables if that's the choice that you're, you're choosing. Or if you want to go from doing it with chicken and doing tofu. That's why I want to hear from Lisa with your firm tofu. How is that working out so far? Where's more cabbage? Uh, it looks it's going okay. Now, is there anybody else? I, I want to be able to make sure if there's someone else cooking with us. Like, I see yeah, what you're doing. Good. Okay, so Michael's going to pin you. Hold on. Who is that? Turn the heat up a little bit to get that to boil, sauce to boil. Yes, yes, yes. Show me, guys, who else is cooking? Uh, Can you ice oh, no. excellent. That's, uh, Lisa? That looks good, Lisa. Lisa, you're oh. a good cook, Lisa. That looks really nice. I, I, I have my sous chef right next to you. Guys, nice chef. Good, chef. Good, knife, yeah. good knife cuts, guys. Good knife cuts. I like it. Call me, I love it. Call me rich. Now, guys, for you, tell me how you would typically serve this. Would you have your white rice, your brown rice, your noodles? What do you? How are you going to serve it tonight? I'm gonna do it over rice. Right. And the thing is, you know, I, 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 white, 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 white rice and chow mein noodles. Yes, oh, that's how I would do. Crunchy noodles on top. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I will. I will tell you guys that. You know, when I, when I would order Chinese food in pre-COVID or go out to restaurants, I did switch from white rice to brown rice. Is there anyone who made that switch with me to be able to do one versus the other? I usually try to use um, brown rice. And, yeah. and guys, the real reason is that brown rice will not shoot your blood sugar back up the way that white rice will do. Like if you have whole wheat pasta or whole wheat bread, versus Wonder Bread or white, you know, white flour, your blood sugar spikes won't be as, as crazy. So I do try to do brown, brown rice when I can. Um, it does have a drier taste. It definitely is, does not taste like white rice does, but because you don't have all that crazy starch in it. So when I have the choice, um, we didn't really get to make rice today. So, you know, when I do my leftovers for tomorrow, I will make rice. Uh, but tonight you'll be able to see this with the noodles on it. And I'm excited, guys, because if I if I got this to pass my don't like chow mein taste test today, <laughs> we're going to really be doing something oh, special. Plate, so, so little plate. Oh, we'll, we'll do plates. So guys, let me just take all this stuff away. Um, but we have to make sure everything is completely cooked. Now, again, Lisa, are you at the point of almost ready to serve? Where are you at with your- uh, We didn't put the bean sprouts in yet, but- Okay, we're, we're, we're all right, ready. so that's the last two things, guys, before we end up serving. It just takes, uh, just, we wanna just warm them up. So let me just put these out of the way, guys. So guys, for me, bean sprouts are not something I routinely use. I appreciate them, but I don't typically use them. So I'm really excited to be able to have a, another added crunch factor. 
you know, you really can't see the cabbage at all. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely. It was very fun. I'll yeah. Have some more. The bean sprouts are going to put the crunch back in. Yeah. And they can. Yeah, the scallions go in. Yep, 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 yep. Four scallions on the bias. Save some for decoration. How much? How much uh, bean sprouts? Uh, the, I did. I did a total of. I think we did three cups. I mean, bean sprouts. Give me a second. Uh, my bean sprouts. Um. <laughs> Where was I? Three cups, yeah. And and cups of beans beans. What's, really, what's really interesting, guys, is I did not know. I've been to places like Fairway, other places where I was able to just pick the, all my own bean sprouts. I didn't realize they actually do bag them. So I actually, Michael, when he went out to that second store, they had a bag of already triple, pre, washed, triple washed bean sprouts. Oh, good to know. So do you guys, when you bought bean sprouts, have you bought them as I have? The texture looks perfect. Yes. It's nice and creamy. Yeah. This looks beautiful, guys. It's I think, not soup anymore. I think there's a good chance Delicious. that I, I, will, I will undo the phobia I used to have with chicken chow mein. You guys have a good shot of this, right? <laughs> see what's going on here. How does it look, everybody? Looks, it looks much better well, than like the color I remember years ago. Yes, right. exactly. That's the thing. I, I mean, it's beautiful. You know, not to get graphic about it, but I think in my my young head, the 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 green celery and the uh, sliminess of the onions. Right. What used to be like? It, it just didn't did not look appealing. And my I'm father always taught me, when you cook and when you want to eat something, you want to eat with your eyes. Mm -hmm. And if it looked like this, I would totally have eaten it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it didn't look like that. It kind of looked kind of like, like like slime. I didn't like it. Yeah, right. And it was not colorful. Mm -hmm. And and by the way that we cut the vegetables on the bias, to me that's another wonderful thing. And the colors, guys. I mean, the orange, the green, the yellow. The you know, it's just to me, it just it's a very appetizing. Oh, I'm very excited look to about it. this. It uh, my husband's getting excited about it. So guys, the chicken chow mein noodles, again, this is the star of the show, people. You got to have chicken chow mein noodles. No, no, I'm here. I know, I know. No, no, it goes on top. Yeah. So normally, guys, we would have rice first. We'll do that again tomorrow. In fact, what I'll do is I'll update you guys tomorrow on my post, uh, and I'll be able to show you. Give me, just give me a minute. I will show you how it looks over rice. And also, I want to tell you if the flavors develop more. You guys know that there's some kinds of food when you're cooking that the second day, you know, it's so much better than the first. Right. I'm curious and I will report, if you guys go to my Cooking with Us Facebook page, I'll report it and I'll let you know on day two, are the flavors more intense, uh, you know, or not, uh, which I think would be great. And I'll be able to plate it with some rice as well. It's like brisket tastes better the second day. Exactly. Cabbage, <laughs> things like that, you know, right? <laughs> How to have our chicken chow mein noodles. Also, guys, one thing I remember when my father grew up on the Lower East Side, he loved to be able to put a little bit of uh, Chinese mustard when he was With eating. Duck sauce. Right, exactly. Chinese <laughs> mustard and duck sauce, exactly. Perfect. All right, guys, I'm going to take a quick picture of me hold and. It, hold it, leave it there. Um, okay. this, this, is not, this is not traditional. But when we want to spice up Chinese food, what is? Show me what that is, Marcy. What is that? It's called sambal olek. It's a fresh Ooh. chili paste. Ooh, go girl! It adds heat to. to oh, food. I like it. I like it. I like it. Love that. That's my plate. Beautiful. Uh, let me get some. Oh, it looks good. You did a good job. What's your so act? You hold back a little scallions for the scallions. I don't know. None of you are offering to put it through the. Uh... <laughs> I, I gotta tell you guys that this, to me, other than missing the rice tonight, this to me looks like a very authentic dish. Yes. You Beautiful. Yeah. I'm gonna make this. I don't know if I have all the ingredients. Next time I go shopping, I'll have to get more of them. Exactly. <laughs> and, and then let me know. Yeah. What is your um? Facebook. So my Facebook page is called Cooking with Stars, guys. Cooking with Stars. Exactly. And you'll you'll know it's me because I'm gonna sit down now. You'll know it's me because you'll have me with my pink chef hat. Um in my personal, you can also friend me personally, and it's Paula Gottlieb Herman. So it's Paula G-O-T-T 
L-I-E-B, and the married name is Herman. All right, guys, I'm doing it. I'm going in. I want a little bit of everything on that first bite. Would you like to taste some chicken? Come, look up, look up, look up. Do one with or one without. Ash, you want to taste? Everybody needs evidence. All right, guys, and I'm going in, people. Enjoy. <laughs> Yum. Mm. Yeah. My friends, okay. if my if my father's chicken chow mein from all these restaurants would have tasted like this, I would have eaten it every week, every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you all also some a couple questions. My father <clears throat> went to the Korean War. He lived in Japan for a while. A nice kosher boy learning about Asia. And a lot of what, what um, Liz said was so true that, you know, I think when my father got to experience Asian culture he were, and came back from the war, he loved everything that seemed, you know, foreign and intriguing, uh, which I think is really awesome. So when I cook, I like to cook with a lot of flavor. I don't use a huge amount of sodium. I am using things like ginger or turmeric or garlic. You know, to me, chili, cumin. Do you guys like to cook with spice at, at, at your age right now? Yes, we need spice. I was going to say, I think I, well, I always knew that as my parents got older, their requirement for spice went even more so. You know, it took a little bit more to be, kind of get those taste buds really activated. So do you guys at this point cook weekly, daily? How often do you guys cook? From time to time? For the holidays? <laughs> I eat a lot. Well, he, he, see, you, you just hit upon something. Whenever I have a new class of students, I will say to them, guys, do you A, like to cook, or B, do you like to eat? If either of those is true, you are totally in the right place. So okay. to me, it's important to like, to like either of those two. Double bonus if you get both. How is it, Chef Michael? Yum. Now, Marcy and Lisa, I would love to hear distinctly how the chicken tastes from Marcy and how the tofu tastes from Lisa. Talk to me, ladies. Well, I have to tell you, we marinated our chicken ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Another recipe that uses some egg and some cornstarch to marinate. Yeah. So the chicken came out very silky. Okay. But um, it's delicious. And with the sauce, um, it's good. I like it. I like the sesame oil on it. It gives a lot of flavor. Exactly. You know, it's funny. The sesame oil, last time I went to the store, they didn't have sesame oil. This time, thankfully, they did. And that one little spoon's worth made a big difference. Uh, and that's the thing, guys. It'll, it'll stay, you know, in your, uh, in your pantry for a while. But like anything else, you know, certainly oils, you know, definitely turn, you know, can turn rancid. So you have to be very, very, very cognizant of that. Delicious. So guys, if anybody would like to take future classes, uh, I just want to share with you that since COVID happened, and I knew that many grandparents were cut off from being with their grandchildren. So we've made it available so that if a child or a grandchild takes a class with us, like Monday night, we do our international supper series, which Marcy does with us uh, at six o'clock at night. Um, but if you want to have your, your kids or your grandchildren taking a class, it would be my honor to be able to get you guys to come in for free. They take the class and then we'll be able to get you on the Zoom so you get to watch your grandchildren, you know, or children cooking. Fabulous. Where are you located? So now guys, I moved from Nassau County. Now I live in Suffolk County. Uh, I live in a section called Kings Park. Have you guys ever heard of it? Oh, yes. 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 So I live in Kings Park um, and so, yeah, so we, we moved here about three years ago. So, you know, of my 19 years of being, you know, out in Long Island, uh, most of it has been in Nassau, but it's been wonderful. It's been great for my business. We have amazing neighbors. It's been a really, it's been a pleasant surprise, guys. I did not expect to like it as much as I do. 
Is it a Jewish area, Kingston? You know, so I, I think it's near Smith. Smith. I am, guys, I am like, I can walk to the synagogue that's right here, uh, which is thankful that I've got, you know, got a synagogue here. I will not say it's a Jewish community. And that was one of the key reasons that, you know, I wasn't so sure I wanted to move out here. But Jews are out here. Uh, the synagogue, when we went, went to um, uh, high holiday services last year, it was, it was packed. So people from Dix Hill, people from other communities, you know, came to Kings Park. It wasn't just local. Uh, so it's, it's a beautiful community. And so far, so far, three years in, we like it. So I was saying to you, so, so Monday night, guys. Thank you, you. Thank you. So Cooking with Stars on Thank Facebook you. or cookingwithstars.com on the website. We update our classes weekly. Uh, and if you have grandchildren who are between the ages of, or in school, K through eight, at five o'clock on Tuesdays, we do an after-school program at 5 p.m. Again, you're welcome to join in. If they're part of my classes, I want you to be a part of that as well. And Sunday morning, guys, is a special, special day. We do a brunch class. Marcy has done it as well. And we've made scones, and we've made lava cakes, and we've made hand pies, and we, we made French our French toast in a mug. We make some frittatas, really beautiful things. Again, if your kids or grandkids want to be a part of a Sunday morning at 10, you're in like Flynn, guys. What do you think? I'll tell you those jelly crackers yesterday. Tell me, tell me. And I, we didn't even get to do it with you, but. I know. I, but I was so pleased, Marcy. It was so nice. <laughs> And the, and, and the look on, on, on Rachel's face was just pure joy. It's good dough, so that's why she, she loves dough. I gotcha, I gotcha. So guys, talk to me, any questions about recipes, anything you guys wanna know, or, or if there are any kinds of classes that you might wanna do, talk to Marcy, talk to Lisa. I would hope that you guys would want me back again. Uh, Absolutely. I love, I love working with the JCC. It has been such a joyful time. Um, we have a couple of special needs workshops that are coming up for Thanksgiving and also in January. So these guys are out there really putting programming together that is very top tier. Fabulous. Very, very proud to be able to be connected to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to leave you with one thing. Whenever my dad would teach me Upon leaving a Chinese restaurant, do you guys know in Cantonese how to say very good meal? No. no. Anybody? No. no. You guys want to know how to say very good meal in Cantonese? Yes. yes. Sure. All right, guys. And it, strangely enough, if it was something you say to from Santa Claus, believe it or not, guys, it's ho ho. Ho ho. Oh. Ho oh, ho! Oh, oh. How about oh, Yiddish? Oh, oh. It's in a good to <laughs> Exactly. Ho <laughs> oh, ho means exactly a really good meal, guys. It, it looks thank delicious. You so much, everybody. It was such a nice time to be able to be with you, see all thank of you, you. Uh, and please, Marcy and Lisa, hire me again. We'll <laughs> yes, for the next. And Lisa, holiday, you did an awesome job. Thank you, thank you so much. What a wonderful way to marry the two of us together. Ooh. Maybe thank you so much, Lisa. Like thank you. Thank you. If you would like to do some matzo bride. Yeah, yeah. we can uh -huh. do that totally. So, Lisa, okay. I'm gonna throw we're doing. I think the we're doing this for Hanukkah, right? Rainbow latkes. That's what I heard. Rainbow latkes. Yes, we're doing it for exactly. Yes. Oh, that's. Fun. Oh yeah. wow. And that was a recipe taught to me by my aunt in Florida. Uh, and I remember she sent it up to us on a little index card and it went right into the pegboard and we'll be able to make latkes, but colorful ones using zucchini and carrots. As you can already tell guys, I like color and texture. Yeah. My latkes should be no different than my chow mein. <laughs> so Lisa, back to you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, before, everybody leaves, before everybody signs out, I just want to let you know that Thursday night we are having a challah bake. So oh yes, I signed up. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, don't want you to forget and please mm -hmm. register for it. All the ingredients are listed there as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But, uh, Lisa, Shafoa, I'm coming over. I want to thank you so much. This was lovely mm -hmm. um, and delicious. Um, clearing the plate, it's Woo! really good. And Enjoy. It's perfect. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, Barbara. Yeah. Thank you, Paula. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.